thank IDSA for the opportunity to uh, uh, present uh, <coughs> some ideas of mine uh, with respect to uh, the Kautilya Atta Shastra and uh, intelligence analysis. Um, now, intelligence analysis is um, um, a part of uh, statecraft, an indispensable part of statecraft. Um, and we are focusing, uh, I will focus here on the cognitive side um, of uh, intelligence. Uh, that is um, um, the uh, sorting out, analyzing, assessing, um, uh, making estimates, um, and thus providing a basis um, <clears throat> for strategic planning. Now, what I want to emphasize also with respect to the previous uh, presentations, uh, what I try to do here is strictly from a political science perspective. And to be blunt, my purpose, why I'm dealing uh, with the Kautilya Atashastra, is I want that Kautilya, the Kautilya Atashastra, gets the place in the international political science discourse that it deserves. That is somehow my motivation why I'm doing uh, <clears throat> what I'm doing. And I think so because uh, the Atashastra is a foundational text of uh, state theory and theorized statecraft of international relations and also of intelligence study as a, as a subdiscipline of uh, <clears throat> political science. Now. Um, we will inevitably face, as you may have noted uh, already in the course of the morning session, certain methodological issues. They are inescapable. We have to face them because um, <clears throat> we, uh, um, we are caught somehow between a rock and a hard place. At the one side, it is the Indologist approach for an hermeneutical uh, interpretation. Um, and on the other side, there is a great eagerness of people to take the uh, <coughs> Atta Shastra and apply it to current affairs. And I think both approaches are problematic. I don't claim that I know what the uh, uh, solution is, but I do know uh, that a rigid uh, um, methodological um, uh, approach is inescapable, because otherwise this is going to be cul de sac. So uh, <clears throat> um, I will simply say, and we will be very, uh, 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 I will not spend much time on this. Of course, in my view, the Atta Shastra um, <clears throat> has a normative dimension. And the idea that this is uh, pure power politics or raw power politics uh, I, and, and amoral and unethical uh, is unsustainable. These three normative principles, as I see, is securing and expanding the power of the state, securing and expanding uh, <clears throat> the welfare uh, of the people. And the third point, which I think is very, in my view, something very significant, uh, is the political um, unification of the Indian subcontinent. That is the, uh, that is the perspective that is adopted by Kautilya, uh, in my view. And in respect to this grand task of unifying politically the Indian uh, subcontinent, uh, <clears throat> Kautilya is a revisionist. He is a revisionist, but that ends that ends at the very moment where we reach the limits of the Indian subcontinent in geocultural terms. And beyond that, I would say uh, Kautilya adopts a classical balance of power politics. Uh, no expansionism. He has no interest in invading, uh, um, in invading uh, uh, Persia or China or something like that. Now, without being able to go into that much more closely, this point about the symbiosis of normativity and purposive rationality, that's a key point made by Max Weber on Kautilya. And I'm not quite sure if you all are aware 
that the one and only uh, Western social scientists who a hundred years ago immediately recognized the significance of the Atta Shastra as Max Weber and uh, who rather extensively has dealt uh, um, with the Atta Shastra in his uh, sociology of religion writings uh, <clears throat> as well as his famous politics as vocation. So um, this, the, the, the uniqueness in my view uh, <clears throat> uh, with uh, uh, Kautilia is that he has this dialectics of normativity and purposive rationality. At the same time, um, uh, uh, you, you can see this very clearly in respect to power of the state, welfare of the people. It's, it's a dialectical relationship. One is not possible without the other. That is uh, his basic uh, um, thesis. And uh, uh, we could say more had we time on the question of uh, 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 the Cautilian concept of raison d'etat, uh, but uh, maybe later in the discussion. All right, so we deal with intelligence here. And if you read the Atta Shastra, it appears to be collection-centric and action-centric. There's a lot of espionage, spies, double agents, informers, what covers, how to recruit agents, um, uh, and uh, equally so action-centric, covert actions, active measures, psychological warfare, uh, destabilization operations. Now the literature, and there is a not insignificant literature on these themes, is, um, yeah, uh, it, it is, uh, you, you can read several books uh, on these aspects of the, uh, uh, <clears throat> of the Atta Shastra. And uh, however, um, I think that's not the whole story. Uh, yes, you can quote page after page on spies and double agents and whatever. Uh, I think there is, uh, there is something else involved, which is why I have chosen uh, to address the question of intelligence analysis, assessment, and estimates as the foundation for strategic planning, because that is the cognitive uh, side of uh, <coughs> uh, intelligence. Now, um, <coughs> in, uh, <coughs> in terms of... Uh, uh, the methodological issue. I, I don't go through it, but simply keep the following things. They are fundamental, almost banal, but they, they, have, to be, they have to be problematized. So we have a translation from Sanskrit into English, which is Kangla. Professor Olli Wells, I'm not familiar with yet. Um, uh, with Kangla, I am, and we have it in German, and I want to show this to you. This is the Atta Shastra in the uh, German translation of 1926 from Sanskrit into uh, German. So uh, even so, I do not speak uh, uh, Sanskrit. I do not speak Hindi. I have the advantage of having a translation from Sanskrit in both German and into English, which is very interesting to compare, because Kangler and Maya it often differ. differ. Uh, but I'm a political scientist. I'm not a philologist. Now, let me say that once more, philology has opened up the Atta Shastra for political science, but philologists, let me say that, are neither political scientists nor intelligence experts. And this dilemma, somehow we have to, uh, uh, <coughs> this dilemma we have to deal with. It's a real, it's a real fundamental uh, <coughs> challenge. Now, um, it's not simply a matter of, uh, political science or intel uh, vocabulary or political science or intelligence studies uh, idioms or things it's the question of the transposition of latent cartilian ideas into categories of modern political science you noted it and there were questions to it quite self-evidently uh, concepts are being used uh, but uh, there is a certain problematic involved, uh, <coughs> and about which we have to be reflective of. Uh, <coughs> now, when we do this, we at the same time must do so without compromising the <coughs> or originality and the eigenvalue of uh, <coughs> Cartilian ideas. I mean, is that dilemma to be resolved? I don't know, but at least we should try. And I think the chances of uh, succeeding are the higher, the more one has a, uh, a consciousness of the uh, problem. 
Now, the approach that I adopt uh, here, um, uh, which is one of uh, um, uh, three, I would say, the most obvious is to uh, 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 locate the Atta Shastra in the context of the history of ideas of political thought in ancient uh, <coughs> India. Uh, the other is more conventional um, uh, comparative approach, which I do believe is c quite fruitful, uh, like comparing it to, to uh, uh, Sun Tzu or comparing it to Machiavelli, um, uh, because as ridiculous this formulation is about uh, uh, Kautilya being the Indian Machiavelli, between the two there is a lot. Uh, I mean, Atta uh, Shastra is 800 years older, but nevertheless, the two are, there, there is uh, what, and here we come to the two key notions, covariance or structural homology. So when you look at which modern categories or concept could correspond to ideas which often are even not explicit, um, which would fit, which could be used to explicate uh, um, uh, these ideas, um, uh, then this um, approach of covariance and structural homology, it's, I cannot explain this, we have no time, but simply to say that the basic thesis about covariance is that in different cultural and temporal contexts, not identical, but intrinsically similar ideas can be developed. And investigating and comparing them is a fruitful enterprise. And actually, um, it may be very helpful to explicate latent uh, uh, meanings. And such, I mean, Cautilia, we won't have the term intelligence analysis, intelligence assessment, estimates. Really. They all don't exist in the uh, Atasha. The idea, however, I claim is very much there. So uh, <clears throat> in terms of um, uh, a structural homology in the field of uh, intelligence analysis, this is Sherman Kent, and I don't bother you now. He's, in my view, he's an American, uh, 1903, 1986. The unmatched theoretician of uh, intelligence studies and analysis. He wrote his book in 1947, 1947, and I don't think any better book has uh, ever since written on the subject. And he has a very interesting definition of uh, uh, intelligence, uh, and you will know, you will notice the term knowledge. Intelligence is knowledge. Um, so, uh, um, you, I don't have to uh, uh, repeat it, but uh, both in terms of an activity and in terms of a resultant or product, knowledge is key. And I c would claim that this is the basic understanding of Cautilia of intelligence. Uh, <clears throat> uh, intelligence is knowledge relevant for statecraft. And uh, as interesting as the collection and action side of intelligence is, this is where things really uh, um, get uh, uh, interesting. You know, he knows the, he uses these terms, the power of knowledge. He says it's ultimately the most important, the power of knowledge in, in statecraft, even more important than uh, financial, economic, or military resources, or the specific qualification uh, <clears throat> of a ruler, uh, be uh, <clears throat> because uh, the uh, uh, the king with the eyes of intelligence and political science is uh, is capable of overcoming uh, <clears throat> of overcoming all uh, uh, competing or hostile uh, uh, rulers. Now. This already starting with book one, and my recommendation for anyone who uh, wants to go get more deeply involved uh, in the uh, Atta Shastra, the first thing is to read very, very thoroughly book one, which is a challenge, but if you have done that, then you know a lot already. Uh, <clears throat> and you will see that there is this, con this concept by uh, uh, <clears throat> a 
Cartilia on the thirst of knowledge as a precondition, a, a, a fundamental qualification of the ruler, uh, thirst of, uh, uh, of knowledge. Um, and um, uh, this thirst of knowledge is not just in the intellectual cognitive sphere, but it's also fundamental for the character sphere. And he, he's very elaborated, uh, um, not very, but rather elaborated uh, um, on this. It's knowledge that disciplines, sublimates, forms your character. And therefore, knowledge is fundamental because otherwise you fall for instinct and affect-driven behavior, the famous six uh, uh, um, uh, enemies. And, and here the thing then becomes fundamental for intelligence. <coughs> Affects and irrationality are deadly for any intelligence analysis assessment uh, um, or uh, estimate. So um, <coughs> uh, the next step uh, uh, which we um, uh, have to uh, uh, take is the uh, anthropological context uh, in which intelligence as a part of statecraft um, <laughs> exists uh, for uh, Cautilia. And this is a world that is divided, conflicted, and anarchical, the world of Matsya Naya. And, uh, uh, that's fundamental point number one. Uh, I will not go through the, the, the basics. Uh, I simply want to say be cautious in terms of using too easily terms like egoism, selfishness, and things like that. I think uh, he has a very, very good understanding in terms of certain uh, uh, anthropological basics, uh, how to deal with them, um, but in order to deal with them, before you supplement, you first have to face reality uh, <coughs> of what you want to uh, uh, supplement. Now, the other fundamental uh, uh, c constraint uh, is uh, change is what is con constant in politics, uh, um, uh, decline, stability, advancement, and that's what I, to be honest, but uh, this can be argued, and I don't want to argue about it now, all the, the people who love mandala so much and make it into this uh, complicated uh, matrix um, of uh, uh, structures, structures, I'm a sort of hesitant because I think the, for me the most fundamental in the mandala is it's totally fluid. It, com it continuously changes and your enemy of the day is your uh, um, uh, is your friend tomorrow and it continuously shifts and uh, um, now but that's a that's a different uh, uh, question because now we come back within these constraints to the question uh, um, of uh, intelligence so um, um, uh, in, in a world of uh, Matsya and Aya um, gaining knowledge through intelligence collection and analysis is a matter of political survival, uh, um, plain and, uh, uh, and simple. And uh, the criteria we have already did it, did defined, it's always the power of the state or the welfare of the people. Now, <clears throat> this here comes the next crucial point. Um, uh, if you, in my view, under want to understand uh, Cartilia correctly, knowledge underpinning statecraft um, uh, that intelligence uh, or this knowledge must be substantive in content and scientific in uh, um, in method. Why do I say that? Um, because um, Cautilia's notion of knowledge, knowledge relevant for uh, uh, statecraft, has the question of substantive Tentativeness, that is data information, data information. First, uh, you need data, you need information, because that's much better than not having data and having not information. But simultaneously, scientific in method. And um, that's some, uh, sometimes a little bit complicated, because Kangler, for example, I mean, uh, he uses, in my view, almost synonymously, um, 
uh, knowledge, intelligence, intellect, uh, science, political science. But in fact, um, there are two dimensions of it. Uh, and that is something which is very relevant for, uh, um, uh, for intelligence. Uh, because information alone is not enough. Uh, in, uh, information alone is not uh, intelligence. So, uh, <clears throat> but before we go into this, because in my view, Kautila is very thorough. Um, uh, the, here, here comes the importance of collection. Uh, the scientific character or structure of intelligence begins with intelligence collection, namely, you have sound empirical data and reality-based uh, <clears throat> uh, information. Um, you, the, the main point is uh, you are not rely on hearsay. You are you not rely on rumors, on uh, wishful thinking, on, uh, but you want to have uh, hard facts. Even so, as I just said, the facts alone uh, <clears throat> uh, don't do it. And he has, of course, which everyone knows, this uh, validity criteria, any, every, any intelligence information has to be confirmed by three independent sources before it's acceptable. But the significance of scientific intelligence analysis is the counterposition to um, uh, specifically magic. And I think this is something uh, which may sound uh, not very original, but if we contextualize now historically uh, 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 Kautilya. I mean, his polemics against uh, magic, I think, are extremely important. Um, There's this famous sentence, uh, the idiot who uh, believes in astrology. I mean, he has nothing against astrology, he has nothing against um, uh, um, magic, but magic is, has only one place, magic has only one place in uh, statecraft by the knowing intelligent ruler against another ruler who believes in magic as opposed to the one who uses it. No other, no other place for uh, <coughs> magic. So the role of astrology, oracles, omen, fatum, think about classical Roman and Greek history, uh, Delphi. I don't see no Delphi in the Atta Shastra. Uh, intelligence, uh, not somehow uh, having some drugged uh, young lady um, telling you uh, what, how the next war will go or whether you should start a war or not, which is what the Oracle of Delphi really is. So um, now it's no, no way, we have no time to go into this, but it simply tells us how differentiated uh, um, uh, uh, Kautilya is. He, 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 he says we always have to differentiate immediate knowledge, mediated knowledge, inferred knowledge. Now, inferred knowledge, that's key. That's a key concept uh, for intelligence uh, assessment and uh, strategic uh, um, uh, plannings. We'll, get, we'll uh, get to this in a moment. Now we come to the next point. Um, it's, it's only really, I can only sketch it, um, that he insists on a discursive, collective deliberation of data and information. Um, so uh, uh, he is someone who is uh, 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 categorically rejecting uh, um, uh, uh, the idea of, uh, of lonely insights, decisions, inspirations, uh, uh, intuition. I mean, this is a very interesting the, the problematic of intuition. Um, uh, and Sherman Kent has, in a wonderful way, dealt uh, <coughs> with that. Uh, I have to leave it to uh, simply making the, um, <coughs> uh, this reference. So the main point is uh, the application of political science in intelligence analysis transforms raw information data into real intelligence that is going beyond the facts. I think this is a basic idea of uh, uh, Kautilya with, uh, with respect to um, uh, um, intelligence uh, analysis. Now, um, this is something which most people um, ignore, but there is a book 15 in the Atta Shastra, and the book 15 is called The Methods of Science, in which he 
expounds 32 uh, methodological categories. Um, and of these uh, four category classes, in my view, are very significant. Because um, what he outlines there are fundamental principles of intelligence analysis and, uh, and assessment. It's, again, it's not your hunch. It's not your intuition. You may have a hunch, you may have an intuition, but that is not a sufficient basis for intelligence analysis. So uh, it's the principle of causality, uh, preliminary explanation, explanations, and conclusions, and then inference and prognostics. And I have no time to go this uh, now into uh, <coughs> uh, the details. However, what is important is that besides one chapter, it's a, it's a, it's a sing, uh, one book, it's a single chapter book, but nevertheless, of going through these methodological uh, <coughs> uh, uh, categories, we have to think about the methodological structure of the Atta Shastra as a whole. With, and there the key question is holistic and comprehensive. And in terms of intelligence analysis, the obvious conclusion is that you have to take such an approach in intelligence analysis uh, <coughs> uh, as well. You uh, have to focus on uh, the totality of the political, economic, fiscal, administrative, uh, military uh, picture. Um, <coughs> now, um, uh, the last thing I wanted to, because people say, before people may say, hey, what is this guy talking about? Um, uh, where is the experience? Where is the, uh, uh, the real life uh, um, uh, Cautilia? And there I do not want to engage in the previous discussion on the date and uh, uh, who is who. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a great sentence by Martin van Krefeld in the, 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 the Rise and Fall of the State, where he says, uh, after working 30 years, the famous philologist uh, inter, uh, investigated whether Homer actually wrote the Odyssey or not, came to the conclusion that uh, <coughs> uh, it was not Homer who wrote the Odyssey, but it was another person, another poet, also by the name of Homer. So uh, <coughs> um, uh, in terms of uh, now the last thing uh, uh, is we've talked so far on the methodological side. But in terms of intelligence, analysis, and assessment, there is also a theoretical side. Um, Cautilia presents us with a set of theoretical concepts which are indispensable and very efficient, in my view, for intelligence uh, analysis. So, uh, um, um, the first is yet is now is more a matter of political anthropology, but the, the setting in terms of conflict of interest and power struggle is very most important is of course the Saptanga theory. I mean the Saptanga theory provides you with a theoretical tool which I mean in my view it's flabbergasting because uh, uh, even so IR is not my background, but uh, here you come to realize that uh, 2,300 years ahead of uh, Hans J. Morgenthau, um, there's a concept of national power, and it was discussed in some of your previous uh, 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 seminars, uh, because the state, the seven state factors um, um, uh, constitute, the, the aggregate of, this, of the, the seven uh, state factors, define state power. And it's, of course, an enormous conceptual advance uh, to define the power of the state, not just in military terms, but in terms of uh, leadership quality, governance, uh, uh, economic resources, uh, um, uh, military resources, f fiscal financial resources, uh, and then also foreign policy, which is, uh, I mean, the military and the, are the last the military is the last before last, and the last is uh, our foreign policy. And then, of course, the question of raison d'etat is this too, uh, too difficult uh, to go through this now. But the next point directly derived out of the Saptanga theory is, of course, the concept of the correlation of forces. 
that's fundamental for intelligence uh, um, uh, assessment. And the important thing is that the seven uh, state factors, you, can, you may not be able to exactly measure them, but you can evaluate them. You, you, can, you can find out how many farmers are producing what, what is uh, their surplus product, what is, uh, uh, what is their tax yield they are producing. Uh, <coughs> you can use qualitative terms in terms of the military. You can say, okay, what is the equipment, uh, uh, the armament, uh, what is the training, what is the leadership structure. You can, you can analyze. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and evaluate um, all of this. And this is the ultimate point. By having this theoretical skeleton or this theoretical structure, you have the means to determine on a rational basis the choice of your foreign policy. Again, it's not a matter of your hunch, of your instinct, or whatever. It is a matter after carefully correlating uh, 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 the respective uh, prakriti of uh, your enemy, of your uh, ally, of uh, the neutral force, or the des or interested or disinterested third party. So uh, <coughs> that's basically um, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, <coughs> the, in my view, the fundamental significance of uh, uh, Cartilia providing theoretical tools for uh, uh, intelligence uh, uh, analysis as part of statecraft, uh, um, uh, of course. And uh, um, so uh, with this, I want to uh, conclude uh, uh, saying that uh, Cartilian ideas and concepts are largely untapped conceptual potential that can be used, uh, and that goes both for the history of political thought and in respect to uh, current uh, uh, questions of political science, including uh, intelligence studies. And again, that's why I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really worth doing something in order to end the marginalization and also the orientalization of the Kautila uh, Tashasta. Thank you. Thank you.